In Jesus' name we pray. And the good people of God said, Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their commitment. And thank you because we're always here so that we can learn together and this work will prosper in our hands. I'm praying tonight, Lord, that you empower everyone once again in Jesus' name. We're going to move forward. Everyone is going to move forward. I will pray, Lord, that everything we need that will make us move forward and make progress in your work, grant to every brother, every sister in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. We're coming to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hushia, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Ezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign, 20 and 5 years old. Well, see, when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem, his mother's name also was uh, Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. In verse 4, it says, And he removed the high places, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpents that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel still burnt, they did burn the incense to it. And he called, and he called it, he called it Nehush, Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. What a great commendation. I pray that will be said of you. And that will be said of me. That he trusted in the Lord, in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him was none among all the kings of Judah like him, nor any that were before him. In verse 6 it says, And he claimed to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 7, And the Lord was with him. What a great thing, the Lord will be with you. His presence will be with you. His power will be with you. And everything we need from heaven, the grace of God that we need, so that everything he has appointed for us to do, we're going to have his presence and his power, and we're going to succeed in Jesus' name. And he, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. As we look at uh, the life of uh, Ezekiah and the ministry of Ezekiah, we can see, number one, revival. Revival. And you see that he began right at the moment that he came to the throne. He didn't waste any time at all. There was revival. And then all through, you see sustainable revival. And then there was commitment to finishing uh, well, commitment to finishing well tonight. We're looking at the message, sustainable revival and steadfastness and steadfast commitment to finishing well. Finishing well, sustainable revival and steadfast commitment to finishing well. We're coming to Second Chronicles and I'm reading from chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. And you'll see the sterling qualities of this uh, great king, Ezekiah. We're told in Second Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 1, Ezekiah began to reign when he was 20 and five, when he was five and 20 years old, and he reigned nine, nine and 20 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, 
the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, not just in the sight of man, and not just in his own sight, in the sight of the Lord who evaluated his ministry, who evaluated his work, who evaluated his labor. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, think about that. He came to the throne, and in the very first year of his reign, in fact, in the first month, think about that. He didn't waste any time at all. He came, and he took the privilege. He took the opportunity, and he took the great uh, opportunity God gave him. And in the first month, in the first year, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and he repaired them. You can see how revival began. It's like when you are sent to a district, or you are sent to a region, or you are sent to a state, and you are there for the first time, and you are not seen. I'm still understudying the people. I'm still looking at the grounds. I'm still looking at this. I'm still trying to get familiar with the people. Immediately, he got there the very first month. You can see it began the process of revival. And I pray that the same thing will be said of us in Jesus' name. It takes commitment, constant consecration, and it takes firmness of purpose to do what he did and to begin, to begin right, and then to have his mind set on the fact that he had started well, he wanted to continue well, and then he wanted to end well. And I pray that every one of us will finish well in Jesus' name. Starting is one thing and going on and on until we finish, Finish well, that's important. Finish strong, that's important. Finish focused, that's important. That is, from the time we take the baton, from the time we become instrumental in bringing revival to the land, and then we stay focused so that we continue. Not only that, that we want to finish graciously. Finish graciously. You want to finish well. You want to finish strong. You want to finish focused. You want to finish graciously. And you want to remain zealous, zealous in the things of the Lord. You want to remain faithful. You want to remain um, uh, fruitful. You want to remain pure and holy and righteous until the very end. I pray it will happen. And the Lord will grant us the grace to be committed and the grace to be faithful until the very end in Jesus' name. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 8. Better is the end of a sin than the beginning thereof. Better is the end of a sin than the beginning thereof. You see, there are people, they can jump up at the beginning and they can get started at the beginning. The first month and the first year, they can do something remarkable as if we never saw anything like this before. But then as months roll on, as years roll on, and as the periods of time, rainy season, dry season, as those seasons roll on, things become different. But in the case of uh, Ezekiel, you're going to see, as we'll see, everything that happened through him, uh, he went on and on and on. And it's a lesson for us that if you start right, you'll continue right. I said you'll continue right. Then you'll continue to do well. And then till the very end, so that at the end, when your work will be evaluated, the Lord will say, it started well, it's finishing well, it started well, it's finishing strong, it started well, it's finishing focused, he has not left his focus. The same focus he had at the beginning is still new. That's the destination, that's the destiny, that's the focus, and that focus will be maintained in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading here from verse 13. It says in verse 13, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. 
Matthew chapter 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end. Tell me out aloud. The same shall be saved. He who has started, that's great. But he who continues until the very end, the same shall be rewarded. The same shall be commended. The same shall be appreciated, and the same shall get to that final destination. It says, he that endures to the end, he that continues till the end, he that remains faithful until the end, the same shall be saved. Hebrews chapter, four, chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3, and we're looking at it from verse 14. Get started. Continue. Hebrews chapter 3, we're reading from verse 14. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If we hold the beginning of our consecration steadfast unto the end. If we hold the very beginning of our zeal steadfast unto the end. If we hold the commitment we had at the beginning, we hold it fast unto the end. Then we are made partakers of Christ. It tells us in chapter 6 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, reading from verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. Have you seen the diligence of the other people that started well and finished well? Have you seen the diligence of the other people that came into the service of the Lord and they continued, no tiredness, no weariness, and no lacking behind, no lukewarmness, and they continued? It says, that will be wonderful if we will continue with the same diligence. Have you seen the commitment, the consecration? Have you seen the continuity in the service of the people that God started and they continued? It says, if we de it says, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto until when? I said, until when? Unto the end. The Lord will give you the grace. I said, the Lord will give you the grace. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 25. Revelation chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 25. It tells us, Revelation, these are the words of Jesus. It says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. You see what Jesus expects? What our Savior expects? What the commander, the captain of our salvation, what he expects, the one who has given us the work to do. Do you see what he expects? He says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. He that overcometh. You see there tonight? He that overcometh. I said, is she there tonight? You'll overcome in Jesus' name. He that overcometh and keepeth. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. Tell me as if you are happy to tell me. My works unto the end. You see that? There are people that they're like the shooting star. And they soar. And they shoot at the beginning. But then, after three months, after six months, after one year, you cannot find them again. I praise God for those of us who are here tonight. And God will continue to rejoice over you. It says, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. As I told you, the topic tonight is sustainable revival and steadfast commitment to finishing well. Steadfast commitment to finishing well. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the transformation in his formative years. The transformation in Ezekiah's formative years. Point number two, the triumph of the first 14 years. The triumph of the first 14 years. Point number three, the tragedy of the final 15 years. The tragedy of the final 
15 years. Number one, we're looking at the transformation in his formative years. We're coming back to Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. And I'm reading from verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 1. Ezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old. And he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right. He did that which was right. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And what is remarkable in this is that his father was not righteous. His father the immediate past king before Ezekiah was not a righteous person. Look at chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 24. Chapter 28, verse 24, this is Father Ahaz. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and caught in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem, contrary to the will of God, contrary to the directives of the Lord. And in every several city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense unto other gods. That was his father, the father of Hezekiah. And it says, and provoked your anger, the Lord God. God of his fathers, now the rest of his acts, and all of and of all his ways, first and last, behold, they are reaching in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And then it says, And Ahaz left with his fathers, and they buried him in the city, even in Jerusalem, but they brought him not into the sepulchres of the kings of Israel, and Ezekiah his son reigned in his stead. The father was bad. The father was idolatrous. The father was defiled. The father was evil. The father was satanic. And yet, when he came to the throne, the very first month he began, and he repaired the house of the Lord. He opened the doors, and everything that the father had done wrong, he reversed everything. The question is, what influenced him? How did that happen? Because normally, a good thing cannot come from a bad place. That is somebody who has been evil, somebody who is defiled, somebody who is notoriously idolatrous. A good king like this normally should not come through him. How did it happen that Ezekiel had this mind for revival and this mind for reformation and this mind to serve the Lord and serve the Lord aright? Look at the influence in his life because you see Ezekiah did not have good example from the father Ezekiah did not have good training from the father Ezekiah did not have good influence from the father he has yet he started right yet he turned out right yet as he came to the throne he did the right thing question what made him different Question, what made him righteous? Question, what made him exemplary despite his father's evil? Look at Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, looking there at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which is so concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Look at this. In the days of Uzziah, that's one king. In the days of Jotham, 
That's another king that followed after that. In the days of Ahaz, that's uh, the father of Hezekiah, in the days of Hezekiah, kings of Judah. You know what happened? Isaiah was the prophet in the land. And he was a prophet at the time of his great-great-grandfather, Uzziah. At the time of his uh, great, uh, his grandfather, uh, Jotham. Isaiah was the prophet at the time of Ahaz. And also at the time of Hezekiah. All the messages of Isaiah. The ministry of Isaiah. That his father overlooked. His father neglected. His father will not even pay any attention to those messages of Isaiah. This young man, before he came to the throne, he was having a good influence over him. Oh, because of the national impact and the national influence and the national ministry of Isaiah. I'm coming to Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. Hosea chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 1. Because we might be wondering, uh, how did he get such a good influence when his father was notoriously evil and yet he turned out right? Because of the ministry number one of Isaiah, look at Hosea chapter one. And we're reading from verse one. Hosea chapter one, verse one. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Berai, in the days of, look at this, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and tell me, Ezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Again, the ministry of Hosea that came to the whole nation from the time of Uzziah to the time of Jotham to the time of Ahaz and then to the time of Ezekiah. Although Ahaz did not benefit Although Ahaz did not take the ministry of Isaiah and the ministry of Hosea to heart, Ezekiah benefited. That's what transformed him. We're coming to Micah chapter 1. Micah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Micah chapter 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah. The Morashi, the Morash site, in the days of, look at this, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah, which is so concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Again, you have the ministry of Micah over the whole nation, but Ahaz did not benefit. Ahaz, actually, the ministry. The ministry of uh, Micah, the ministry of Hosea, the ministry of Isaiah had been before Ahaz was born. Because it was a ministry at the time of Hosea, at the time of Jotham, and then at the time, all through the time of Ahaz. And yet he did not benefit, and now Ezekiah says such a ministry like this should not be wasted. And such direct ministry that penetrated the whole nation. Why is my father not listening? When I grow up, I'm going to take everything to heart. Well, if you ha when you have time, you read all the ministry of Hosea and all the ministry of Micah. I'm going to concentrate now on Isaiah. Because you see, Isaiah preached. Isaiah prophesied. Isaiah proclaimed. Isaiah warned the people. Isaiah invited the people. Isaiah told them about God. Isaiah told them to pray. Isaiah told them how they can have a righteous life coming from God directly. All that Ahaz did not take to heart. But you see this, Ezekiah, this was what helped him in his formative years. The word that he had. Let's come back now to Isaiah. I'm reading from chapter 1. Number 1, Isaiah called the nation to righteousness. Isaiah called the nation to righteousness. And Ezekiah was hearing all that and he took that to heart. Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. And the ox knoweth his owner. 
and the ass his master's grip. But ice, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider a ah, sinful nation, a people leading with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They are forsaking the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, when you spread your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now. He, he proclaimed. He told them about their sin. About their transgression. Now he gave them the mercy of God. The invitation of the Lord. Come now. And let us reason together. Says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, They shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. Number one. Isaiah called the nation to righteousness. Number two. Isaiah rebuked their hypocrisy. Look at chapter five. I'm looking at chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah rebuked their hypocrisy. In chapter 5, verse 20, Warn to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Warn to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 23, we justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's the message of Isaiah. And that one, that thing was influencing Ezekiel. And he was wondering, why is daddy not listening? Why is my father not following after? Why is he not repenting? Why does he remain evil? As for me, I will not follow as my father. I'm going to have a change, a transformation. Isaiah kept on and he exalted God's word. He exalted God's word. While he has was busy about idol worship, about uh, making uh, sons to pass through the fire. You know what uh, Isaiah was saying? He exalted the word of God. Chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And it's got thought of that. From what I'm hearing, there's no light in Ahaz, my father. This is not the way of light. This is darkness. And Isaiah made it very clear. It sank down deep into the heart of Ezekiah. What a challenge for us. In all our communities, we'll see people who are not following the word of God. In all denominations and churches, we'll see people who are not following the word of God. We're not going to say everybody is doing it, so let me join them. No. Like Ezekiah, you make up your mind and you say, the word of God is still the word of God. If they do not according to this law, it is because the word of God is not in them. Actually, as uh, Isaiah number four reproved unrighteous rulers. He reproved unrighteous rulers. Look at chapter 10. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. One to them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people that, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. You see what uh, Isaiah did? Isaiah was very firm. Isaiah did not allow the rebellion of Ahaz and the idolatry of Ahaz and all the bad, bad things Ahaz was doing to shut his mouth. He went on. He kept on. In fact, number five, he proclaimed God's judgment. Isaiah proclaimed God's judgment. This is where this young man got conviction. 
This is where this man saw the need of repentance. This is where this man saw, I must, when I get there as a king, I'm a prince now, I'm a son to the father. When my father leaves that place, God give me chance, God give me a place to stand, and I'm going to turn everything around. This is why he got his consecration, because of the messages that Isaiah was given. Isaiah warned the people of the coming judgment. Look at chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah did not mince words. Isaiah was very direct and he said, the Lord is going to bring judgment. He's going to destroy the sinners out of it. Look at verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil is not only Judah, not only Jerusalem, not only Samaria, and not only Israel. I'm going to extend that punishment for sin towards the whole world. I will punish the world for their evil and the weak and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Look at verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall be removed out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the day of his fierce anger. That was the message that turned uh, uh, Ezekiel around and he said, I'm hearing all this and my father is doing all this. I will not follow my father. I know there's a God in heaven and I know there is judgment because of sin. And I'm not going to allow the example of my father to lead me astray. Isaiah denounced backsliding. Isaiah denounced backsliding. Look at chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 10. Chapter 17, verse 10. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. He's talking to the nation and he's talking to the people. You knew the God of salvation. You believed in the God of salvation, but now you have forgotten the God of thy salvation and has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shall thou plant pleasant and plants and shall search each in the strange sleeves in that in the day shall thou make thy plants to grow and in the morning that shall thou make thy seed to flourish but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow that was the message of Isaiah to the nation he also condemned and he watched them of unequal yoke. He saw the nation going astray and he saw the nation uh, having some partnership with uh, all those, uh, you know, idolatrous nations and they were copying them. And so Isaiah spoke against the unequal yoke. Look at chapter 30. In chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord that take counsel but not of me and that cover with a covering but not of my spirit and they, that they may add sin to sin that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth and to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, therefore, therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zohan and his ambassadors came to harness. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be an hell or profit, but a shame also a reproach. You see what Asa was doing? He was saying that unequal yoke with unbelievers, unequal yoke with all those worldly people, it was something wrong, and Isaiah made them understand. Look at chapter 31. Chapter 31, I'm reading from verse 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for hell. Woe to them 
that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. He, he spoke against their unequal yoke. And then he spoke unsparingly against the life of sinning. He spoke unsparingly against the life of sinning. Look at chapter 33, verse 1. Chapter 33, verse 1. Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou was not spoilt, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee, when thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled, and when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with you. That same chapter, that's chapter 33, look at verse 13, in verse 13, hear ye that are far off, what I have done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might, the sinners, in Zion, are afraid, fearfulness, are surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire, who among us shall dwell with everlasting bodies. And so Isaiah made it very clear to them that the way of sinning is the way of punishment, is the way of perdition. And there was going to be even everlasting bodies. He wants them. But you know something about the message of Isaiah that turned on Ezekiel, that influenced Ezekiel, that revived Ezekiel, that gave hope to Ezekiel, gave faith to Ezekiel, gave conviction to Ezekiel, and gave commitment to Ezekiel, gave consecration to Ezekiel, and he gave revival unto Ezekiel is the other side of the message that Isaiah offered mercy, offered God's pardon. Look at chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon as Ezekiel was hearing all this and was wondering in his heart, my father has gone so far into evil, gone so far into idolatry, gone so far into a uh, charming of uh, enchantment, he's gone so far into satanic worship. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? And then the message came, Isaiah calling them to mercy. And he says, seek the Lord because there is pardon for the penitent. In fact, Isaiah spoke about God's salvation and God's righteousness. Look at chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. I'm reading here from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has closed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You know what Isaiah was saying? He was saying, if the people repented, God will forgive. And then with the forgiveness, salvation will come and righteousness will come. He also gave them God's invitation to mercy. He said, don't think you've gone so far. The mercy of God is available. And the heart of this young man, young Ezekiah, before he got to the throne, hearing all this, that spurred him on, that challenged him. God will forgive. God will give salvation. God will give righteousness. And that if I come, the mercy of God is available. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah 55 verse 1. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Ezekiah, are you thirsty? Do you want the mercy of God? Do you want the grace of God? Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come, come ye, buy and eat, and ye shall, and, and ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. He says, Wherefore do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Or your labor for that which satisfieth not, hacking diligently unto me. Eat ye, 
that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and i will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of david that's the thing that challenged the young man that mercy was available and there was assurance of acceptance if you come the Lord will accept you. If you come, there'll be assurance that he will answer your prayer. Isaiah chapter 49, I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 49, and I'm reading from verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time have I had thee. You know, Isaiah was saying, yes, the situation is bad. Yes, the sins are terrible and great, but... There's mercy with the Lord, but there's pardon with the Lord, but there's salvation with the Lord, but there is um, acceptance with the Lord. Thus says the Lord in an acceptable time, have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will, I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth and cause to inherit the desolate heritages. And so, uh, look at chapter, chapter 30. Chapter 30. And I'm reading from verse 19. Chapter 30, verse 19, I say, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. You didn't hear that one? Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And that's the thing that brought assurance to the heart of Hezekiah. He said, yes, I know there is sin in the land. Yes, I know there is evil in the land. But he said, I will pardon. I will give salvation. I'll give righteousness. I will show you mercy. I will give you assurance. I will give you acceptance. He even had about God's power. Look at chapter 40. Chapter 40, I'm reading from verse 28. Chapter 40, and I'm reading from verse 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power. He giveth power. He's going to give you power tonight. He giveth power to the faith and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. That's what gave courage to this young man. That's what gave conviction to this man. That's what, why he said, as sinful as the nation is, as terrible as Ahaz, my father, is, look at God stretching forth invitation to everyone and he's saying come and he made up his mind he was going to go to the Lord and then revival started in his soul renewal started in his soul regeneration started in his soul and then when he came to the throne immediately he brought that same fire fervency and revival and this thing will come in your heart it will come in your soul. And as it comes in your soul, and you get back to the district, and you get back to the region, and you get back to the state, and you get back to where you have appointment to serve the Lord, this fire will burn everywhere in Jesus' name. Because as I also said in chapter 43, chapter 43, I'm reading from verse 18, chapter 43, and we're reading from verse 18. It says, remember ye not the former things, former times of weakness, all that is gone. Fainting, all that is gone. Discouragement, all that is gone. Asking question, can I be an agent of revival? All that question is gone. Because from today, God will raise you up. You'll be an agent of revival in Jesus' name. It says, remember ye not former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, behold, tell me now. 
Behold, tell me what's going to happen to you. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. It was such a ministry of Isaiah. And when you also look at the ministry of Osea, and you also look at the ministry of Micah, it was such combination of ministry that inspired Ezekiah, that gave hope to Ezekiah, that gave faith to Ezekiah, that brought an irreversible decision to serve the Lord to Ezekiah. It was this kind of ministry and this kind of message that brought conversion to Ezekiah, that brought transformation formation to Ezekiah and brought spiritual passion and the pursuit of a, a zealous a, a revival in the whole nation in his own heart in the formative years of Ezekiah. And it's very important in the formative years in your own life as a God is a transforming us and reforming us and changing us and making us to have something you know, for a future ministry. I pray that this time will not be wasted in your life in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now, the triumph, the triumph in the first 14 years. The triumph in the first 14 years. Remember, he became a king. He sat on the throne at the age of 25. And then he began the first month, the first year, the work of revival and the work of restoring the nation unto God and the work of reestablishing righteousness in the nation. And he continued for 14 years. Let me show you that in Second Kings chapter 18. Second Kings chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 13. Second Kings chapter 18, verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Ezekiah, this Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fair cities of Judah and took them. He had continued from the first year, and then he went on until the 14th year. Come back now to verse 1. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Oshia, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Ezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, shortened from of Abijah, and the daughter of, um, of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and he break the images and he cut down the groves and he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, a God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him, for he claimed to the Lord and departed not from following him, but he kept the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses, and the Lord was with him. I said, and the Lord was with him. And he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchmen to the fair cities. And then it goes on what he did. If he was able to do this even at his age. 25 years of age and he came to the throne and he will not compromise the standard that he had learned all through those formative years if it happened to him you have a better covenant it will happen through you you spread the word of righteousness and this word will go through you with power unto the community in jesus name look at what he did number one he did right he did right. Isn't that what he was telling the Lord in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 3? 
2 Kings chapter 20, verse 3, I beseech thee, O God, remember now how I have walked with thee in truth, with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. When he prayed, he appealed to God on the basis of his doing right. And I pray that when you pray, you have something to refer to. And the Lord himself will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. Number two, he destroyed idols. And he trusted in the Lord. He destroyed idols. And he trusted in the Lord. In your community, that he is in the local church where you belong to. And sees God has given you a place to stand there. A place to establish the standard there. A place to do the right thing there. Anything that is not of God that is idolatrous. Anything that is not of God that is contrary to the word of God. You'll stamp it out. I said you'll stamp it out with the same vision and with the same courage or the same power of Hezekiah. You'll do it effectively in Jesus' name. Second Chronicles chapter 31, I'm reading from verse 1. Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse 1. Now, when all this was finished and all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and they threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and also Manasseh. And then he goes on to say, until they had utterly destroyed them all, then all the children of Israel returned every man to his possession or into their own cities. And Ezekiah appointed the causes of the priests and the Levites after their causes, every man according to his service, the priests and the Levites for bond offerings and for peace offerings to minister and to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the tents of the Lord. He organized the people and he reorganized the people. I pray God will give us the intelligence to do that. And they were told, number three, he clave unto the Lord his God. He clave unto the Lord his God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 4. He clave unto the Lord his God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, chapter 13 verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Anything that will bring separation, remove that and be in covenant relationship with the Lord and keep to the Lord and cling to the Lord and cleave unto the Lord and stay with the Lord without ever turning away. Not only that, number four, he restored true worship, the true worship of the true God. He restored the true worship of the true God. In Second Chronicles chapter 29, Second Chronicles chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 3. Second Chronicles chapter 29, and we're reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them and repaired them. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression, have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. All that his father did to mess up the worship of the Almighty God, he reversed everything courageously because he wanted to restore true worship of the true God. Number five, he led the Levites to sanctification. He led the Levites to sanctification. As Second Chronicles chapter 29. In Second Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 5, and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves. 
not only the house of God, yes, they sanctified the house of God, but sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Look at uh, verse uh, 15 here. In verse 15 it says, And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves. They gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves. And they came according to the commandment of the king uh, by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priest went into the inner part of the house to cleanse it and they brought out all the uncleanness that were found in the temple of the Lord unto the court of the house of the Lord and the Levites took it and carried it out abroad into the brook Kidron. And so you find that he was not sparing at all in this uh, process of revival. Uh, number six, he restored Judah to righteousness. He restored Judah to righteousness. Second Chronicles chapter 29, reading from verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 20. Then Ezekiah rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, and they brought forth the he goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation and they laid their hands upon them and the priest killed them and they made reconciliation reconciliation with God made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel for the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering shall be made for all Israel and then in verse 25 and he said the Levites in the house of the Lord with the symbols and subtries and with the halves according to the commandment of David and of God the king's seer and Nathan the prophet so uh, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets look at verse 31 in verse 31 then Ezekiah answered and said now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord come near and bring sacrifices and thanks offerings into the house of the Lord and the congregation the congregation the whole congregation brought in sacrifices and thanks offering as as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings number one you see what he did he did right in the sight of the Lord number two he destroyed idols and he trusted in the Lord Number three, he clave unto the Lord. Number four, he restored true worship of the true God. Number five, he led the Levites to sanctification. Number six, he restored Judah to righteousness. Number seven, he served God with a perfect heart. He served God with a perfect heart. We're coming to Second Kings chapter 20. Second Kings chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 1. In those days was Ezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart. Remember how I walked with you and I walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart. And I have done that which is good in thy sight. Look at verse 4. And it came to pass, a four that is before I say was gone out into the middle of the court, into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Ezekiah, the captain of my people, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. The Lord has heard your prayer. I said, the Lord has heard your prayer. I've seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Look at verse 6. And I will add unto thy days, what? If you want that, I said what? And I will add unto thy days 15 years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And so you find God answered his prayer, and God will answer your prayer. I come to point number three now, the tragedy of the final 15 years. He had been given 15 years. I want to ask you a question. If God were to give you extra 15 years to your life, how will you spend those extra 15 years? Here was Ezekiah, and the Lord said, Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And then he turned his way, his face to the wall, and he prayed to the Lord. And I'm asking Ezekiah, what do you want to do with 15 years? What do you want to do with extra life? And he answers back, he said, can't you calculate? I got to the throne at the age of 25. I've only spent 14 years. And 25 plus 14, somebody there, help me out. 25 plus 14, somebody there. 39. And then at 39, he became sick. And the Lord said, now your time is over. Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And he said, I'm not even 40 yet. And I'm supposed, I want to live more. I want to live longer. That's all right. And he prayed. And God added 15 more years to his life. So that he died later at the age of 54. But now the question is, Ezekiah, are you going to spend the next 15 years that the Lord has given you? And let's see what happened. We're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. And I'm reading here from verse 24. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Reading from verse 24, it says in verse 24, In those days, Ezekiah was sick unto death, and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. But, after the healing, but, after the answer to prayer, but, after the extra 15 years, but, Ezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. For his heart was lifted up. That's pride. Therefore, there was wrath upon him, upon Judah, and upon Jerusalem. You see, after you've got the miracle, ask yourself, what am I doing with this miracle? After you've got the healing, ask yourself, what am I doing with this healing? After you've got the deliverance, the protection, the provision, what am I doing with that deliverance? What am I doing with the protection? What am I doing with the provision? In the case of Ezekiah, we're told he did not render the proper thanksgiving unto the Lord with his life. Look at verse 31. Verse 31, how be in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land God left him you remember in the first 14 years the Lord was with him the Lord was with him but now prayer no more cry to God no more revival slowed down Serving the Lord, slowed down. I got my prayer answered. I got 15 years extra. I told the Lord how I walked perfectly before him. 
and then perfection slowed down. And God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. We're coming to, we're coming to Isaiah chapter 39. Isaiah chapter 39. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 39. Still talking about the story of this Ezekiah. What happened? After the healing, in chapter 39 of um, Isaiah, verse 1, at that time, Merodach Beladan, the son of Beladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Ezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Ezekiah was glad of them, and he showed them the house of his precious things, and the silver, and the gold, and the spices, and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all the dominion that Ezekiah showed them not. These were strangers, and these were unbelievers. These were pagans. These were heathens. And he came to him. He showed them everything. Verse 3. Then came Isaiah, the prophet, unto King Ezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Ezekiah said, They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, what have they seen in thine house? And Ezekiah answered, all that is in mine house, advice, uh, have they seen, there is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then Isaiah uh, said unto Ezekiah, hear the word of the, of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that, and that which thy fathers have laid up in a stop until this day shall be carried to Babylon and nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Look up here for a moment. You remember when this same Isaiah came and he said, set your house in order for thou shalt die and not live uh, the discuss said, that's all right, I've heard, I'm going to die now. Did he say that? What did he do? Turned his face to the wall and he prayed. And now, look at this, look at this. Isaiah said, what have they seen? They've seen everything. And then he said, thus says the Lord. The days are coming. That all these things they have seen, they'll carry them away. We will expect that a person like Ezekiah, who prayed before when he had terminal sickness and God reversed everything and gave him 15 years extra, well, I've thought that a man like that will pray. But no, look at this in verse 7. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Ezekiah said unto Isaiah, tell me he said that's all right good is the word of the lord the man has lost his fervency in prayer he had lost his focus in prayer he had lost his passion for the glory of god he has lost the the, the thing inside him that will want to defend the people of god and defend the land of judah he said good is the word of the lord which he has spoken. And he said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. He had become selfish. As we look at this man, what do we see? Number one is prayer and purposelessness. Prayer and purposelessness. He prayed when he was sick. He got 15 years. What's the purpose of the 15 years? When God said, set your house in order. Put everything right and put the right peg in the round hole and make sure that everything is established and then be ready to come over to heaven. And then he prayed. And we're asking the question, Ezekiah, why did you pray? Why did you want to have an extra time, extra life? 
the prayer and the purposelessness of that prayer. Number two is prolonged life and its pointedness. No point. Prolonged life and the pointedness. There was no point. The pointlessness of such a prolonged life. Number three is pride and prayerlessness. It's pride and prayerlessness. Now he was proud. All those Babylonians came. He conducted them around. What he didn't even do for leaders and elders in his own nation in Judah. He did for all these strangers. And then eventually, when it was challenged that this is what will happen, he didn't pray like he used to pray. Wasn't fervent like he used to be fervent. Wasn't determined like we used to be determined. I wasn't seeking the Lord like he used to seek the Lord. It's pride and prayerlessness. Number four, the prediction and his pervasiveness. The prediction. All these things will be taken away. That's all right. All your sons that will issue out of you will be taken away. That's all right. The prediction came. He was pervasive about it. He wasn't bothered about that. Number five is passivity and permissiveness. Passivity and permissiveness. Have you noticed? It was given 15 years. And after three years of that extra time, Manasseh was born. And there's no record that he ever instructed Manasseh, directed Manasseh, influenced Manasseh. And there was no record that inspired Manasseh to live right. Because now he had a permissive attitude. Young man, you want to do that? All right. You want to go your own way? All right. You don't want to follow me? You don't want to follow my example? That's all right. He was passive. He was permissive. Number six is position and powerlessness. He had the position of still king. Nobody challenged him. But all those 15 years, what's the power? What's the pungency? What's the passion? What's the drive? What did he do? Nothing. He wasted those 15 years extra years is position and powerlessness number seven is posterity and perverseness is posterity and perverseness we're coming to second kings chapter 21 second kings chapter 21 is posterity that is the son that followed him manasseh the son that reigned after him the perverseness of that child and that child turned around reverse turned upside down everything that Ezekiah had put right in the nation we're coming to second kings chapter 21 second kings chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 1 manasseh was 12 years when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in jerusalem and his mother's name was Ephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. After the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again, he built up again, he built up again the places, the high places which Ezekiah's father had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove. As did Ahab, king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord. Think about that. He built altars in the house of the Lord, of the which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven, in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son to pass through the fire, this Manasseh, and observed the times, and used enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits, this Manasseh, and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to hunger, to anger. 
It says, a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of the witch, the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, out of all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither did I make, uh, neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave to their fathers only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, according to all the law that which my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not, but they hearkened not. And it says, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Do you see that? He reversed everything. Every good work that Ezekiah had laid down, this man reversed everything. And he turned the whole of Judah back to Baal and back to evil and back to idolatry. That's what the Lord is telling us, that we need to look at our latter days, our latter times. How were you when you first came to the Lord? What zeal did you have? What commitment did you have? What consecration did you have? Now, this latter part, for the next 15 years, if Jesus tarries, what do you intend to do? How do you intend to spend the next 15 years for the glory of God? Remember, 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 he wants us to think of our latter end. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 28. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 28. He wants us to think of our latter end. What shall it be? And what will you do? And how will your life be? How will your service be at the latter time? It says in uh, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy verse 28, for they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Verse 29, oh that they were wise. Oh that Ezekiah were wise. Oh, that we were wise. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. It's not enough to have 15 extra years. What are you going to do with those extra years? It's not enough to say, I got healed, I got extra time, I got extra strength. I got extra money, I got extra job, I got uh, extra privilege. What are you doing with that extra privilege? Oh, that they were wise and that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. We're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Think of your latter end. Think of the latter years. Think of the extra time you have got. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 37. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 37. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. The Lord is coming. I said, the Lord is coming. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But thank God, verse 39, verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them, tell me out aloud, that believe to the saving of the soul. You will continue with the Lord. I said you'll continue with the Lord. First Peter, first Peter chapter one, verse thirteen. First Peter chapter one, verse thirteen. Wherefore, get up, get up, thy the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end. To the end. Don't slow down. To the end. Don't turn back. To the end. Don't become easy going. 
You cannot change anything anymore. It says, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You will not slow down. You will not look back. You will not go back. You will be stronger and stronger. What am I talking to there? Strength will come today. Greater strength in Jesus' name. Job chapter 17. Job chapter 17 verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Stronger and stronger. Who is that? Stronger and stronger. Strength, greater strength will come. Greater power will come. Psalm 71, Psalm 71. I'm reading from verse 15. Psalm 71. We're reading from verse 15. 71, verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth. And hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Look at verse 18. Now also, now also, tell me. Now also, tell me. When I'm old and gray-headed, oh God, forsake me not until, until, until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. More strength, more vigor, more zeal, more power, more drive, more passion in Jesus' name. Psalm 119, 119, Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 32. Psalm 119, verse 32. I will run. Everybody, I will run. Let heavens hear you. Let deeper life church hear you. Let every opposition hear you. You will not slow down. You will not look back. You will not slack back. You will not be weak. You will not close your eyes to revival. You have started, you will continue. You are running well, you will run better. I will run. Somebody there tell the Lord. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it until when? I shall keep it until when? Somebody is ready. I said somebody there is ready. Until the end, until the end, until the end. No slowing down. I will run. You run after me. I will run. I said, you run after me. We're ready now to take this land. I said, we're ready now to take this land. Who is ready to run? Who is ready to run? Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, I will run, I will run, I will run. I'm not tired, I'm not tired, I'm not tired, I'm not weak. I will run, I will run, I will run, I will run, I will run. You tell the Lord, tell the Lord, tell the Lord. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord, I will run, I will run, I will run, I will run. I'm not going to slack back. I'm not going to deal like Ezekiah that those uh, final 15, 15 years amounted to nothing. Extra 15 years, nothing. Extra time, nothing. Extra strength, nothing. But new power coming to you. New anointing coming to you. And you telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm ready. Pick up whatever you have dropped. Let the revival continue. 
Let the fire keep on burning. And let every sin the Lord wants you to do. Say, Lord, I'm ready now. I'm taking it up now. I'm going on now. I will run. I will run. I will run. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. I will run. No looking back. I will run. No slowing down. I will run. Extra time. Extra 15 years. Extra strength. Extra power. Extra authority. Extra knowledge. Extra development. That the Lord is giving us. What are you going to do with it? I will run. I must run. I must run. 